and brought to us over the last 2,000 years by men and women, boys and girls even, who are willing to die for their faith in Christ. We read it just a moment ago. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Psalm 1610. A fantastic prophecy as we discover from reading the New Testament concerning the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. On this bright and glorious morning, we celebrate the most joyful day since the creation of the world. On the first day of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Also on the first day of the week, physical light came into the world, but on the first day of the week is when Christ rose from the dead, bringing us eternal light and hope and peace. On the first day of the week, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to fulfill the day of Pentecost. That also occurred on a Sunday, opening the door of light that would spread around the world. On the first day of the week, the church has, since her birth, on Pentecost Sunday, celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. But even at creation, there was darkness before light. When Christ died, there was hell before heaven. There were flames before that cooling draft of water. There was pain before peace. That's what we're told here in Psalm 16. And that's what we're told in Luke chapter 16, which describes the conscious reality of hell in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who wrote the Apostles' Creed understood this truth. Those who wrote the Westminster Confession and the longer and shorter catechisms also understood this. It's clear in the other Reformation confessions of faith as well. At the end of the service today, we'll be partaking of the Lord's table. And we'll be reciting the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are printed in your bulletins this morning. And among those words are these. He descended into hell. When you read the five key documents penned by the Westminster Divines, you find an affirmation of this truth. In fact, the Apostles' Creed is contained immediately following the larger and shorter catechisms of the Westminster Confession of Faith. This key point of belief has been the history of Bible-believing Presbyterians from the very beginning. Hear what it says in the larger catechism in question 50. And here is question 50. Wherein consisted Christ's humiliation after his death? Answer. Christ's humiliation after his death consisted in his being buried and continuing in the state of the dead and under the power of death till the third day, which hath been otherwise expressed in these words, he descended into hell. That declaration is likewise stated in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7 of Christ the Mediator, paragraph 4. This office of mediator and surety the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake, which that he might discharge, he was made under the law, and did perfectly fulfill it, endured most grievous torments immediately in his soul, and most painful sufferings in his body, was crucified and died, was buried, and remained under the power of death, yet saw no corruption, and as we have just read in the Catechism, as which hath been otherwise expressed in these words, he descended into hell. There is no disagreement in the other great confessions of faith tracing to the Reformation, including the Belgian Confession of the Netherlands Calvinists of the 1560s, the Heidelberg Catechism of 1563. In 1581, the Harmony of Confessions was published, which likewise had no disagreement with the stabbing truth of Christ suffering the painful terrors of hell for us. Even the anti-Calvinist Lutheran formula of Concord of 1580 had no disagreement with the statement that Christ descended into hell. The Czech Hussites and the French Huguenots 
were in agreement, and even the Armenians had no quarrel with the biblical statements concerning the suffering of Christ for our sins under the wrath of God in hell. There's no denial of this sobering truth in the Helvetic, Helvetic Confession of 1675, a confession that was written in stiff opposition to the flood of Arminianism sweeping the theological field. In short, it is only as we study the teachings of the heretics and the apostates in the church history that we ever discover a denial of a real hell. And thus, a denial that Christ, who as infinite God, son suffered under the wrath of the Father in a literal, flaming, burning hell. Literally taking our place and paying in the flames an eternal penalty in a finite period of time, a payment that we as finite creatures would have had to pay over an infinite eternity. Apostate Rome has invented purgatory for adults and limbo for babies as a kind of halfway house, but purgatory and limbo are not in the Bible. And I heard yesterday that just last week, the Pope himself stated that there is no eternal burning hell. That's the position of the Christ deniers of the apostates and the heretics. So that brings us to a personal question. Do you personally deny the reality of an eternal burning hell, a place where the souls of the damned will burn for all of eternity, eternity never to be consumed or annihilated? Do you think that at death the souls of Christ rejectors and Christ haters will cease to exist? It permeates everywhere. I once heard that there's someone in this very church who does not believe in an eternal burning hell. But be warned, friends. If you reject the reality of hell, you stand in a long line of heretics, apostates, and deniers of the faith. And not only so, ah, but here's where it is important. You deny one of the greatest works of Christ. You deny the fullness of what he accomplished by smashing the gates of death and of hell wide open. If you deny hell, you minimize the work of Christ and trivialize his great salvation. If he doesn't save you from hell, what does he save you from? Although it's an unpleasant subject to the modern mind, escape from hell is one of the most exciting and powerful blessings brought to us by the resurrection of our Lord. For you and me, there is only one way to escape the damnation of hell. It is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who shattered the bars of death, who opened the way to heaven for all who believe. Listen to the description that Jesus himself gave of hell. Jesus gave hell this description. It's a warning for all and a blessed relief for those who have been delivered by the power of the resurrection. In Luke 19, Jesus is speak, uh, 16, Jesus is speaking, beginning in verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, this is Jesus speaking. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, 
Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That was Jesus speaking. Did you hear what Jesus said? He permanently linked the rich man in hell to the resurrection of the dead. That was no accident. Jesus was describing what really happened to real people before the cross and the resurrection. In the Old Testament, the place of the dead was called Sheol in Hebrew, the grave. It was not a place of non-existence. The body was left behind on earth, but the spirit and soul dropped into Sheol. In the New Testament, this pre-cross abode of the dead is called Hades, or Hades, as we would say in English, but Hades in Greek. Before the death of Christ and his resurrection, Hades was divided into two compartments. One side was a place of flames and torment. The other side was a place of blessing and bliss. That side, as we see in our text, is called Abraham's bosom or paradise elsewhere in the New Testament. Everybody who died from the days of Adam up to the resurrection of Christ went to one side or the other. As we'll see in a moment, the resurrection of Christ smashed open one of those two sides. In that narrative in the Gospel of Luke 16 that we've just read, there are at least ten different keys that we must observe. First, this is not a parable. The narrative describes actual events. You see, the Gospels always tell you when Jesus is giving a parable, they say, and he spoke to them in parables. But this one gives us actual events. In parables, people are not given proper names. But Lazarus in Abraham's bosom is mentioned by name. Second, it's clear that people in flames were conscious and could feel the torment. Third, it's clear that they were not being consumed or annihilated. Fourth, it is clear that they still had memory of earth and the things that they did on earth. Fifth, it's clear that they still remembered loved ones on earth. Sixth, it's clear that they didn't want anybody else to end up in hell. Seventh, it's clear that they knew what paradise, the other side of the abyss, was like, and they wanted to be there. Eighth, between the two sides, there was no way to cross in either direction. Ninth, there was no water in hell and no relief from pain and thirst. Tenth, nobody in hell comes back from the dead to talk to people on earth. Only the resurrected Christ could break the bars of death and come back. 
Only Christ has the power and authority to cause others to rise from the dead. But some of you are probably Bible scholars, and so it raises a question. So what about the other people whom God raised from the dead in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? Ultimately, all of the people who came back from the dead in the Bible have two things in common. Number one, they were only temporarily raised from the dead. And number two, all of them, every last one, finally died for good. Just like all the people who were supernaturally healed, all of them eventually died as well. They didn't stay permanently well, either in the Old Testament, for example, like Naaman, who was healed from his leprosy, or in the New Testament. They all eventually died. There were some temporary, but only temporary resurrections like this even in the Old Testament. For example, Elisha raised the little son of the Shunammite from the dead in 2 Kings 4, verses 18 through 31. And after Elisha himself died and was buried, another funeral procession passing by saw some Moabite bandits and threw the body into Elisha's tomb so that they could run away. And as soon as the body touched Elisha's bones, it stood up. In the Gospels, Christ raised Lazarus and the son of the widow of Nain. And at the crucifixion, many graves were opened and the bodies of believers came out and appeared to many in Jerusalem, but these all died again. None of them are walking around on earth today. But when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it was permanent. He rose never to die again. That's what Paul says in Romans 6, 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death have no more dominion over him. But let's talk for a moment about where Jesus went when he died. I'm sure you know that he specifically gave us the exact location so that we don't have any question about it. You did know he told us exactly where he went. Just as Luke is the only gospel writer to record the record of the rich man and Lazarus, even so Luke is the only one to record the words of Jesus to the thief on the cross. Luke 23, 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. <clears throat> and he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's an exact location. We know exactly where that is. In Luke 16, it's called Abraham's bosom. The thief had faith in Christ. That's all he had. He never had the opportunity to get baptized. He never had the opportunity to do any good works. He never led anybody else to Christ. He was a criminal on the last step of death row. But that very day, the day Christ died, he would die also. And on that very day, he would be with Jesus in paradise. He wouldn't cease to exist. He would not be soul sleeping. He would not be absorbed back into Brahman. He would not reincarnate as a skunk. He would be with Jesus and know who Jesus was. Now let's see what the scripture says Jesus did while he was in hell. Peter writes about it in 1 Peter chapter 3 beginning in verse 18. He begins with the crucifixion. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also, now listen carefully, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Which ones? He tells you in verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. 
Noah. Long before even Abraham, who was 2,000 years before Christ. That's highly significant. You see, we already know what Jesus said to the thief on the cross, that Jesus went to the good side of the grave, to paradise. But Peter tells us something else. <coughs> Jesus did what even Abraham and Lazarus could not do in Luke 16. Jesus crossed the horrible, impossible chasm between the two sides. It says, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. These weren't the good guys in Abraham's bosom. These were the bad guys who refused to believe at the preaching of Noah. These were the millions and millions of people who were drowned in the flood because they rejected God's warning of coming judgment. In other words, Jesus was on the prison side where sinners drop into hell. Jesus was on the side where flames torment those who have rejected the grace of God. Jesus was on the side where he personally suffered the wrath of the Father. Jesus was on the side where he literally paid for our sins in the torments of hellfire. Jesus was on the side where even today, Christ rejectors drop into free fall the minute their miserable, God-hating souls leave their bodies. And apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, there are no good people. There are no innocent pagans. There are no nice, godly, non-Christians. You may not like it, but that's what the Bible says. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they've used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. David confirms that in Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I hope you understand the warning. God says that as an unbeliever, you already have one foot in the grave and the other foot on a banana peel. You have been warned, just like the rebel God-haters in the days of Noah. You have heard this message. God warned the millions and he's warned you. Are you going to be like those millions who drowned in the days of Noah and skidded down the molten lava ski slope into hell? Don't you understand what the resurrection of Christ did when, like a mighty Samson, he ripped off the gates of hell for those on the paradise side? So, all right, let's see what Jesus did when he broke out of the grave in hell. You know, he didn't just break out for himself. He didn't break out for himself alone, but he did three things. He broke out for the men and women of faith of the Old Testament on the paradise side. He led them out of a massive jailbreak. And three, he made a permanent and complete pass-through so that now when a believer dies, he goes straight into the presence of Christ. What's the proof? Well, let's see where all the believers who have died since the resurrection go immediately on death. They go according to the New Testament someplace else rather than stopping in Abraham's bosom as described in Luke 16. When a believer dies today, he does not have to stop in Abraham's bosom. He or she does not have to look across the gulf at the torture side of the grave. He or she has an instant transponder right into the presence of God. What does the Bible say? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know... That if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's your body. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed of our house which is from heaven. If so, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. None of the old Greek philosophy here of the 
progression of the aeons where you get higher and higher and the less material you become and the more spirit you become, the better off you are. The Bible speaks of a resurrection body. For we that are in this tabernacle, that is in these bodies, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up. Mortality, that's the ability to die. Something's going to swallow up mortality. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In other words, we go immediately into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. That's explained to us in greater detail when we discover what Jesus did as prophesied in one of the very important messianic psalms quoted in the New Testament. The New Testament tells us exactly what Jesus did, and it explains how he did it. In fact, the New Testament quotes a messianic psalm that prophesied what Jesus would do after the resurrection at the ascension. Psalm 68 a thousand years before Jesus was born, prophesies the ascension of Christ. We know that's a correct interpretation because that's how the New Testament quotes this passage. Here are the key verses in Psalm 68. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. That phrase, the chariots of God, is a reference to the Shekinah glory of God, which is composed of burning angels, the seraphim. That means the burning ones. They surround the Lord's presence in the dwelling place of God. They burn but do not consume as at the burning bush. In other words, the place where God dwells, surrounded by holy angels, is heaven, the place where God himself lives. That's also clear from the other three descriptive phrases. Number one, the Lord is among them. Number two, as in Sinai. In other words, God's personal presence descended on top of Mount Sinai when God gave the law to Moses and Moses spoke to God face to face. And number three, in the holy place. That's a reference to the holy of holies in the tabernacle and the temple where the Shekinah glory of God rested, showing that he was personally present in the midst of his people. Verse 18, our key verse, also has the phrase, that the Lord God might dwell among them. That's personal contact with believers. That's the verse that speaks of the ascension after the resurrection. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive. That verse is quoted by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.8. And I want you to notice the context. Verse 8 is in the specific context of Christ descending into hell. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Psalm 68 also indirectly prophesies the coming of the Holy Spirit, but it directly prophesies the giving of the spiritual gifts. Thou hast led captivity captives, thou hast received gifts for men. And you know something? That's exactly how Paul applies Psalm 68 in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 and following. Listen to what Paul gives you immediately following the description of the spirit. Uh, it's a description of the spiritual gifts. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That's quoting Psalm 68. And what's the next verse? And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Dear people, the Old Testament is full of Christ at the early service this morning. We talked about how Christ 
always pointed them back to the scriptures. The New Testament wasn't written yet. He pointed them to the Old Testament. It says, he explained, he expounded unto them the Old Testament scriptures, Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, the things concerning himself. Jesus is all over the Old Testament thousands of years before he was born. Only God can do that kind of prophecy. We also know for a certainty that Psalm 16, 10, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. We know that it refers to the resurrection of Christ because that's how Peter quotes it twice in his first sermon on the day of Pentecost when God poured out the Holy Spirit and started the church age. Peter is preaching, he says, Him, speaking of Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And then he quotes from Psalm 16. Verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And then he goes on and he says, David wasn't talking about himself because the tomb of David's still here. His body is still here. But he, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, Christ was a literal physical descendant of David, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Verse 31, we see Psalm 16, 10 quoted the second time. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Jesus, the resurrection, but first the descent into hell to bear the penalty for your sins and for mine. Let me go back for just a moment to that phrase that Jesus led captivity captive. We don't have to guess what that means since we have a warrior illustration of that phrase in the book of Judges. In Judges, Israel had sinned again in the painful cycle of that book and had come under the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. Israel was deeply oppressed for 20 years by the captain of the army whose name was Sisera. He was a powerful oppressor with 900 chariots of iron who held Israel captive. Then Israel cried out to the Lord, and God raised up Deborah the prophetess who announced that Barak would deliver Israel from Sisera. On the day of battle, Barak led an army of 10,000 men against Sisera and crushed his army while Sisera fled on foot. Sisera was sheltered by Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, but when he fell asleep, she took a tent peg and nailed it through his head into the ground and killed him. Nice lady. <laughs> Barak delivered Israel from captivity. He made them free from Jabin, king of Canaan. And then God gave Israel rest for 40 more years. Now that narrative is found in Judges 4 and repeated in Hebrew poetry in Judges 5. And that's where we find that phrase that's quoted in the Psalms and in the book of Ephesians. Judges 5, 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. In other words, those are words describing the slavery and bondage of the Jews, followed by an intense, bloody fight and a huge military victory of immense deliverance of God's people. The captives were led out of their captivity. They were given their freedom once again. And that's what Jesus did when he won the immense victory over death. He smashed the gate of the grave. He led those in paradise into heaven. Did you know that Jesus had more to say about hell than he did about heaven? There are at least two reasons for that. Number one, hell is a real place, and he gave us fair warning. Number two, he wanted us to know so that he would personally make a way for us through his death and resurrection so that we wouldn't have to go there. I'll just read you a couple of verses of Jesus speaking without comment. This is Jesus talking. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. 
Fear not them which can kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the hell fire. Ye serpents and generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better to enter into life and be maimed rather than having two hands to go into hell into a fire that never shall be quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which hath, after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Jesus clearly taught a literal, real, burning hell. Now let's look at the future to see what's going to happen to the other half of the dead that Jesus left behind at the resurrection and at the ascension. Those who were left in the flaming and burning half of the grave where all the unbelieving dead have gone from Adam until the present. Remember, Peter called it a prison. That second half is sort of like a holding tank at the local jail where criminals are kept before trial where they'll be condemned and then sent off to the state penitentiary. Remember that the New Testament Greek word translated hell is hades or hades. That's what we find in the book of Revelation, where we find what happens to the entire half of those who have not gone to heaven. Oh, and there are going to be some others there, too. I'll tell you about them here. Revelation chapter 20. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Dear friends, torment in the lake of fire lasts forever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, now listen to the next phrase. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. There's that second half. People who are already in torment. People who rejected the gospel, the good news of salvation. Who laughed at the warnings of God's judgment. Death and Hades, Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Now, what happens to that entire half of the grave? It tells you in verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire. That's even worse than the second half of Sheol or Hades. Dear friends, Jesus died for you. He paid the burning penalty for your sins, a penalty that you would have had to have paid for all of eternity. He went from the good side of the grave across that impassable gulf and preach judgment to the lost that their doom was sealed because they had rejected God's gracious salvation. And then he smashed open the paradise side of the grave and led captivity captive into the presence of the Heavenly Father and into the presence of the Shekinah glory. Now all who have trusted him go directly at death into his heavenly presence. The rest of the dead go to the flaming side of the grave. And from there they will all be judged at the great white throne and will all be found guilty. For their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. 
Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. What an incredible promise to God the Son from God the Father, and what an incredible hope for the resurrection. Do you understand what Jesus did for you in his resurrection? There is a literal, flaming, eternal, burning hell. Your sins would have sent you to hell. When Jesus died for your sins, he paid for them completely by his death on the cross and his three days in the grave. During that time, he descended into hell. He suffered the wrath and torment of hell that you and I deserve for all of eternity. When he saves us, he saves us from hell. If there is no hell, there would be no reason to speak of salvation. If there is no hell, Jesus would not have had to die for you and for me. If there is no hell, then we can live any way we want. If you deny a literal burning hell, you deny one of the primary reasons that Jesus died on the cross and smashed open the gates of the grave to save you from a screaming, burning hell. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. The Father did not leave his soul in hell, and if you trust the risen Christ alone, you will never have to experience it either. Remember this dead serious warning that we just read. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But the resurrection is the key to life. It's the key to genuine peace. The resurrection is the key to lasting peace. The resurrection is the key to instant peace. Do you realize how many times in the New Testament it talks about peace after the resurrection? There are 104 verses that speak of peace in the New Testament. Some verses even speak of peace twice, making a total count of 111 uses of the word peace in the New Testament. That's what Jesus promised to his followers in John 14, 27, 16, 33. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus promised peace to his followers. Do you have it? Peace was his very first greeting to the disciples after the resurrection. In fact, he said it three times. The same day at evening, during the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. Verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Shalom. That's why the New Testament is filled with words of peace. It's the resurrection that gives us peace. Before we were controlled by fear of death and hell. The Bible says so. Hebrews chapter 2, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that's Jesus, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy them that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And having made peace, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead, that's the resurrection, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you, that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
fear, death, flames, eternity in hell, or peace, joy, guaranteed hope, heaven, by trusting in the risen Christ alone. The choice is yours. Make it wisely. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the resurrection of Christ. How we thank you that he died for our sins. He shed his blood, for without the shedding of blood there is no remission. He suffered the agonies, the torture, and he died in our place. Your sinless sacrifice, your sinless Lamb of God, he was buried. He descended into hell. And he crossed the chasm to declare that his work was finished to all those who had mocked and scoffed and scorned. And the third day he broke the bars of death. He cracked the gates of hell from their foundations. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He ascended into heaven where he sits on the right hand of God the Father, from whence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. He's coming back for us who've trusted him. At the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them in the clouds, and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. O oh, Father, if there is anyone here or in the internet audience who has not truly trusted Christ alone, the risen Christ, for his or her salvation, let them this day believe on him unto life eternal. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn in preparation for the Lord's table is number 413. Break thou the bread.